Uh, we will see what to do. I mean, in the sense that then maybe if somebody is still interested, we can take a look at some of the more technical aspects of the whole thing. So in the first hour, I wanted to just um, give some kind of introduction to the area, some background, some statement of results, some maybe some implications. OK, and I would like to welcome you to ask questions anytime. So please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. I would be very happy. And if there is any problem with the connection or you don't hear me anymore or anything, or you can't read my writing, please just let me know. Okay, so the the starting point, uh, the starting point is the, the technique of forcing. So this is a, There is some very weird background noise. I don't know. Uh, maybe. Do you also hear it or? I guess it's my fault because I had the audio activated. Now I turn oh, it. Don't do, don't worry here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. So. Um, now I don't hear and see anybody anymore. So I'm lonely in my room and I talk to this machine. Okay, good. So I, we start with the technique of forcing. So this is a this is a talk in set theory. Forcing is one of the key techniques in set theory. It's a technique for <laughs> for producing um, out of uh, given models of set theory, new models of set theory. So you, um, you, f you fix a partial order in your given model of set theory, you pick a generic filter for it, then you make sense of the forcing extension by adjoining this generic filter um, to your ground model, and this gives a new model. So this is a very broad technique, which a variety of applications often used to show independence in set theory and other things, which was invented by or isolated by Paul Cohn in the 60s. Okay. So this is this is one of the, if not the key technique in, in set theory. And I just mentioned independence proof. So it can be used to produce, to show that certain statements are independent, for instance. And then the question is how universal is this method, right? Um, you know, can you show everything which is independent? Can you show that by forcing how universal is the met method or are there restrictions? Uh, under which hypothesis are which restrictions? So this is this is kind of our starting point. But but I will get to um, to to the more technical things in a, in a little while. Okay, so let's start with the following question: Which um, consistent statements? Can be forced. So what do you mean by a consistent statement? So we are doing set theory here. So I talk about statements which you can formulate in the language of set theory. And by consistent, I mean, let's for the moment just say consistent with the axioms, with the standard axioms of set, set theory, namely ZFZ, Samilo Frenkel. And consistent means the usual thing that, that you know, that, um, that you, uh, something is consist, consistent with ZFZ if you can add it to ZFZ without introducing any in, uh, inconsistencies, right? You cannot prove zero equals one. So the, the standard uh, concept of consistency at this point. And for something to be forcible, that it can force it, I simply mean, you know, that there is a forcing so that when you pass to the forcing extension given by that forcing, then the given statement is true. Okay, so there are, uh, there are easy counterexamples in the sense that there are examples of statement which are consistent, but they cannot be forced. For instance, the negation of the consistency of ZFC. That's a nice exercise. So with ZFZ, the consistency of the non-consistency of the ZFC is consistent, right? Assuming, of course, that uh, ZFC is consistent. So there is a model of ZFC which thinks that ZFC is inconsistent, but these kinds of models you cannot produce by forcing. Why can you not do it? Because forcing does not change the natural numbers. So every statement about natural numbers, and this is one of the statements, the consistency of ZFC is a statement which is pi zero one. So it's a statement of the form 
uh, for all natural numbers, blah, blah, blah. Um, so the whole statement is uh, sigma zero one. So these kinds of statements, which only talk about natural numbers, they cannot be changed by forcing. Okay, so any, uh, Any arithmetic uh, statement or no? I'm sorry, I have to turn off my. Okay. <laughs> no arithmetic statement can be for changed by forcing. Or the truth value. of no arithmetic statement can be changed by forcing. Okay, what about more complicated uh, statements, right? So what is the next, uh, what are the more, uh, what, are, what are statements of the next complexity uh, beyond arithmetic statements where you talk about natural numbers? Well, set, theoretical thing, set theoretically thinking would be statements about sets of natural numbers, but sets of natural numbers in a very natural way can, um, uh, are related with uh, real numbers, right? So, statement about real numbers. <clears throat> so, what about statement? I don't know why this does. Oops. Sorry. No. What about statements? about real numbers? Well, here it depends a little bit. You know, we, we still ask the question, can you change a statement about real numbers by forcing? Well, it depends a little bit. Okay, um, as far as the method of forcing goes, um, you, you can change the theory of real numbers in general, but still, even if you are in situations where that can be done, then uh, forcing is not the only technique which uh, comes into play. There is another technique, namely a constructability theory, which you sometimes need. For instance, to give you an example, the statement that there is a delta one, two well order of the reals, a very simple um, the well order of the reals. This is a statement about real numbers. It can be phrased as a statement about real numbers, uh, but this statement um, cannot simply be forced. It is consistent with CFC, but you cannot start with a, an, a given model of set theory, do some nice forcing, and then arrive at a delta one two well order of the reals. In contrast, you need the uh, theory of constructability to construct a model. Or you can also con construct models with more complicated, uh, but still projective well order of the reals, but forcing is not the right technique. And it comes even worse, namely, let's write that down, in the presence of large cardinals, you cannot change the theory, uh, the projective theory at all. So in the presence of large cardinals, uh, statements about real numbers cannot be changed by forcing at all. So more precisely, what I mean by that, if you start out with a model of set theory, which is um, which satisfies uh, strong enough large cardinal hypothesis, then no forcing whatsoever will change the theory uh, of the real numbers. Okay. So let's move on to more even more complicated statements, right? So we had the natural numbers statement about natural numbers. We had the real numbers. Well, the real numbers, if you think set theoretical, what does it correspond to? Every real number is countable. And so the set of real numbers corresponds to the set of all sets which are hereditarily countable. Usually we write it as HC or uh, we write it as H sub omega one. So this is all the sets which are hereditarily of size less than omega one. And up here, these things would correspond to the uh, the natural numbers would correspond to sets which are hereditarily finite. So this is H sub omega. So the next thing would be H sub omega two. Um, 
Well, there is no other notation. <laughs> um, so H omega two is the is the collection of all sets. Well, maybe you could make a correspond. Uh, reals is power set of omega, and H yes. omega two is power set of omega one. Yes, yes, yes. That's that, that we can do. Right. That's a good point. Thank you. I could write the power set of omega one here. So, con um, so but okay. This this comment corresponds to to this object over there. So that's the collection of all sets which hereditarily. are of size at most LF1. So these are the sets, as Matteo says, which are coded by uh, subsets of omega-1. Hereditarily means that they are of size LF1, the elements are of size LF1, and so uh, at most of size LF1, and so on, and so on. So what about the theory theory of the collection of all those sets? Well, now it gets interesting. And um, so, for instance, you know, the statement, um, there is a famous statement in set theory, namely the continuum hypothesis. Usually abbreviated by CH. Um, this is, uh, this can easily be seen to be sigma 2 over H omega 2 as a statement. sigma 2 over h omega 2. What you have to say is, you know, the continuum hypothesis is true if and only if there is an enumeration of the reals in order type omega 1. So there is this enumeration and then you have to say, well, and every real shows up in this enumeration. So this is where the second, uh, the quantifier nesting comes in. So it's a, it's a sigma, it's of the form, there is something so that for all blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this is, but in any event, it's a statement about this, about this structure. So this structure here, H omega 2, answers the continuum hypothesis. Okay. Uh, the other new feature is that the axiom, of, uh, the axiom of choice comes in at this level. Um, namely, for instance, there is an interesting, uh, not only the question whether there is a well order of the reals, there is another very interesting combinatorial object which can be defined over H omega 2, namely the non stationary ideal. On omega 1, may be defined over H omega 2. So the non, we like talking about the non-stationary ideal. It has a dual, namely the the club filter. Uh, if you if you prefer thinking of the club filter, it's kind of the same thing. So a a subset of omega one is club. You know if it's uh, closed and unbounded, and the subset is stationary if it meets every club. So a non-stationary set is one which avoids every club. Uh, so the non-stationary ideal can certainly be is certainly pi one over h omega two. And by the way, I'm not sure we will get to that, but uh, there is an interesting question, namely whether this is optimal or may, or whether the non-stationary ideal can also be defined in a sigma one over h omega two way in a parameter. And um, this is independent, but in the presence of the axioms, which we will discuss, uh, there will be an answer and maybe I will get to that, we will see. Okay, anyway, uh, this is an important object and why is this relevant also? I mentioned the axiom of choice. So key properties of the non-stationary ideal or of the club filters um, are given, are due to the presence of the axiom of choice, namely for instance, the fact that the club filter is not an alter filter or in other words that you can split omega one into two disjoint stationary sets, or in fact, it's true that every stationary set can be split into omega one many stationary sets as a result of Solovey. This uses uh, the axiom of choice and it falls without the axiom of choice. So this is the level H omega two is the level where the axiom of choice or the fact that there is a well order of the reals at all um, 
or a, a well order of, of this part of the universe uh, pops in. Okay, and, and gives uh, some structure. So there are very interesting questions about the non stationary ideal, which you can ask, and it's a combinatorially a very interesting object. Um, for instance, the question where, whether it's, it's saturated, whether it's omega 2, uh, omega 1 dense <laughs> uh, is. Okay, so um, because this level answers the continuum hypothesis, we all know that the continuum hypothesis is uh, independent of the axioms of set theory. You know, the situation here with H omega 2 is completely different to the situation uh, with the uh, natural numbers or the real numbers, namely we can manipulate it by forcing very easily. So there is no hope to prove in general, you know, that um, that the theory of H omega 2 is kind of frozen under forcings, but there is something we can say here. Okay. Now, um, so remember that we discussed the question if phi is consistent, then phi can be forced, right? We, we, we I started out with, with um, trying to address the question, is the method of forcing kind of universal? Uh, so if we want to give some kind of positive answer to this sort of question, uh, then we will have to restrict, uh, we, will, we will need a, a stronger, you know, we, we saw that not everything that's consistent can be forced trivially, so we need a stronger form of consistency if there is any hope of answering this question positively, but also, um, uh, also, what now? I forgot what I what else I wanted to say. So, if if there, uh, I also we we need to restrict the uh, the, the class of uh, statements phi which we will consider. Right. So, two things: we need to strengthen the concept of consistency, and we have to restrict the classes of statements phi uh, to which this is to apply. Okay. Uh, if there is any hope. For a positive answer, we need to restrict, uh, we need to strengthen the uh, notion of consistency. Here, also, we need to restrict. Uh, the class from which the class of formulae from which phi from which phi may be taken. Okay. And this is now what I want to talk about, and then I will come to the statement of the key result of my talk. Okay. So the notion of um, we first have to strengthen the notion of consistency. And if you do that, there will be actually a positive answer. You know, eventually I will, we will write down something for, so that this has a, a positive answer. In fact, you may even restrict the class of forcings, which you uh, are allowed to, are allowed to use. Okay, so as far as the strengthening of the notion of consistency goes, this leads to uh, Hugh Woodin's notion of omega consistency. So this needs to be strengthened to omega consistency. Um, and in fact, we will have to strengthen it even more to some extent in order to arrive at what the, the the point I want to make in this talk. Okay, so what is what is omega consistency, right? I mean, consistency simply means that there is a model. Basically, what omega consistency is that um, you can demand that the models in question, which your opponent has to provide in order to uh, show consistency, are not just models. Maybe you want them to be transitive, you know, we, we think that theoretically, maybe you want them to contain certain large cardinals and so on, right? So something would be, um, you know, vaguely speaking, a statement is omega consistent 
if it's consistent with all large cardinals which you can imagine and which are consistent. So there is a way to make this precise. Um, I want to very briefly talk about that and then we move on. So let's, for the rest of my talk, let's assume some large cardinals. And I want to uh, define omega consistency. Um, so, so we start out um, with a function from the reals to the reals, uh, which is universally bare. So I want kind of um, a natural way of extending a given function to a set to, to a generic extensions. So I need to require something about a function. So the, the, let's start out with a function which is universally bare. Um, so the most convenient way to, to define universally bare here is um, that you have a pair of trees so that one tree projects to F, the, the other tree projects to the complement of F, and this um, property of that the trees are complementing in this sense, this gets passed to every set generic extension. So in every set generic extension, the trees also project to complements of each other. If that's true, then F uh, in every, In every generic extension, F has a new version, which we usually denote by F star. So this is a very well-known phenomenon, right? For instance, if you um, if you look at Borel sets or a Borel function from the reals to the reals, there is always an ob obvious version of such a function in any generic extension, right? You don't take the function itself, but what you do is you, you you kind of run the definition of the function in the generic extension, and that's your new version of the function, right? And it happens that for the old reals, the new version does exactly the same as the old version did, right? So it's an extension of the given function by by absoluteness, and the same the same is true here. Okay, so this is this is just a generalization of um, what you can do with Borel functions. Uh, and in the presence of large cardinals, there are just more universally bare sets than there are in ZFC than Borel functions. Okay. Um, also, the the statement that the given f is a the statement that f is a function. Uh, this is pi 1, 2 in F. So in the presence of large, uh, this is absolute. So this will also be true in every um, generic extension. And we say that F is code invariant. This is a key concept. F is code invariant if and only if uh, you know, for all reals x and x prime. So here I'm talking about reals. If x and x prime code the same thing, so a real, you know, you can take, we mentioned this very early uh, in the beginning of this talk, that the reals can code elements, elements of HC uh, sets which are hereditarily countable. So if the two reals code the same thing, then you want to say that this is also true for the images under F. So that's what I call code invariant. And also code invariants, um, this is also pi 1, 2. So it's also true in every set generic extension if it's true in the ground model. And then it happens, um, well, for one thing, we can extend F um, 
uh, not you know we can extend f to act on all um on all the reals of every uh, set generic extension of v but now we can also have f induce a function which we will also call f which acts on all of v and in fact on all of um uh, on all the objects in any uh, set generic extension of v right we may extend or let, let's not extend is not the right way induce uh, if f from the reals to the reals is universally bare and code invariant then f induces a canonical function which I also write f, forgive me, from the, from the universe to the universe. So what you do is you take a set x from here, you make it countable in a set generic extension, you know, you code it, you code it by a real x in a generic extension of v where you make x countable. So you do the collapse of, you know, you, 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 let me just write you collapse uh, x to omega. What I really mean is that you collapse the transitive closure of x to omega. Okay, so you code it by a real there. You apply the new version of f to x and you uncode. Right, every real code something. And this is this gives you a while. Yeah, was there? A I, I, I have a silly question. Yes, of um, course. You, you, I don't remember this thing. Uh, if you have a universally bare function, you say you have this representation with a pair of trees that project to f and the complement, and yes. then you define uh, in the generic extension the function f star, right? But yes. does this function f star depends on the pair of trees that you have, or what? Yeah, whatever pair you take, you always get the same extension. Yes, you get you always get the same. So um, okay. it's it's a it's an easy yeah it's an it's an it's an exercise uh, to show that f star is not sensitive to the choice of the okay. Okay. Uh, that can be done yes uh -huh. and also um, in, in a similar way um, what I'm doing here now I claim that uh, this function f induces this new function f. You can, for one thing, you have to show that this is well defined, and also you have to show that it's independent of the of what you are doing there. Right? I start out with a capital X. I want to assign a capital Y, but you know I, I'm doing all kinds of things which might make it not uh, well defined. Right? I code capital X by little X, and so on and so on. But actually, nothing depends on how exactly I do it. So the Y is uniquely given already by the x. And in fact, I can do that not only for v, I can also do this uh, in any set generic extension of v, right? In fact, do, do you automatically get that uh, the extension you define of f maps v into v? So that, that if you take an element in v, you do this trick because you do the, the yes. you compute this this extension in a generic extension. This is uh, true. Yes, effect. this is this is a this is a mutual genericity argument, right? So you um, so you want to show that y is actually in the ground model of v, right? So you code you code capital X by, by a little x, which is in one extension, and by little x prime in a in a mutually generic extension. And they give an output. It gives the same output. Uh, you know, the like by code invariance. Ah, let's see. Sorry. Right. If on the left hand side you code capital X by little x and you code it by little x prime, right? You have these two values. Right. So these things they both code capital X. So these things over there they they both code something, and the something what they code I call it capital Y. But if x and x prime are taken from um, generic extensions which are mutually generic, then capital Y will be in the in the intersection, so it's in the ground model. I see. Okay. Right. So uh, it actually gives a function from V into V, and in fact, you can do. You know, it didn't matter at all that we started out by V. You can also take a capital X from your favorite set generic extension of V. Right. In fact. Um, 
uh, we get f from any set generic extension of e to that set generic extension uh, for all for all p. Okay, so this is a little bit of stuff. Um, so what we want to say is, by way of definition, um, a statement phi is called omega consistent. Remember that we still, throughout my talk, let's say now, I, at least for these kinds of discussions, we assume that large cardinals exist. I, I'm not going to write it down that this is a prerequisite of this of this definition. It's called omega consistent. If for all universally bare functions, which are code invariant, there is an F closed model, which at this point you may take to be countable if you want. Let's say a model of, you know, consistent, we want to say consistent with CFC. So M is a model of CFC plus uh, phi. Okay, so what is an F closed model? Well, we said that such a function, uh, it induces a function from V to V, right? And then for a model M to be closed under, under F, you just mean that the induced, that is closed under the induced function, right? So what is, a, what is an example? Um, I mean, in an example, you know, when we, we work in the presence of large cardinals, uh, so one of the examples which in complexity are kind of intermediate are, you may take the function which codes the, the sharp function, right? Every real gets mapped to its sharp. So X gets mapped to X sharp. This is a function which can be in the presence of large cardinals, which is coded in that fashion by a universally bare function, which is code invariant. And then F closed simply means that the model M is truly closed under sharps. Okay, if you if you chase through all the definitions, this is what it means. So this is why I said in the beginning that basically what omega consistency means is that the model M um, can be re required to be as closed under large cardinals as you want it, right? You, you give me a large cardinal concept and then I have to give you a model uh, of phi, which also satisfies this large cardinal concept. It's a little bit, um, technically, it's a little bit different. It's not only that M thinks there are large cardinals, it's that M is truly closed under the true large cardinals, for instance, under the sharps or more complicated operators. Okay. Okay, so this is what omega consistency means. Here, here when you say F closed, you mean F restriction to M? Yes, to yes. M. Yes, 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 yes. So this simply means, uh, I don't know what the arity of the function f is, let's, let's just say it's, yeah, I simply mean that, but, but you know, the, the f here is not the, the original f, but the one which is induced, right? Maybe I should have given it a different name. f induces a canonical function, let's call it f tilde, okay. And then what I really mean is the F tilde here, right? So it's a, it acts on every element of M. It not only acts on the reals of M, it acts on all the elements of M, right? Okay. So there is something which you wouldn't cause the, oh, this is by the way, um, it's just a different way to spell out omega consistency to how you wouldn't does it, but it's equivalent. So the omega conjecture says the following, uh, that if phi is omega consistent, then uh, phi may be forced. And I think you don't want to have that for all statement. This might be a little bit too much to ask for. So the phi here should be a sigma two statement. Sigma two is a local statement. The statement is sigma two if and only if it can be verified in a rank initial segment of the universe. So you don't have to look at, at the entire universe. You can kind of verify it locally. Once it's true in a V alpha, it's just it's just true. Okay. Um, okay. And now I want to 
I want to pass on now. You know, this is something where we could talk about. Um, I'm not going to. I'm not. I don't want to talk about the omega conjecture. The omega conjecture is still open. But we are going to present a proof, not a proof, but a, a a result which could be taken as a proof of a variant of the omega conjecture, and it might be that the proof of that sheds sheds some light on how one might be able to attack the omega conjecture. Um, but there would still be a lot to do, so it's really not that um, we are getting kind of close to proving the omega conjecture. It's really a significant variant of the omega conjecture. Um, and in order to formulate what I want to talk about, I formulate the concept, uh, a concept which is related to omega consistent, and I just dubbed it honestly consistent just to have a word. Um, so uh, a variant of omega consistent, which fits You know, we are talking about uh, forcing here, so which fits a more restricted class of forcings, namely forcings which preserve stationary sets, which fits um, the class of forcings uh, which preserve stationary subsets of omega one. Right. I mean, the forcing preserves stationary subsets of omega simply if uh, every stationary set which you have in V, stationary subset of omega 1, is still stationary in the extension. Uh, so let me uh, formulate it. So the associated, in order to um, uh, um, yeah. So a statement phi, so here is just a definition. A statement phi is honestly consistent if, well, again, for all universally bare functions f, for which you, re, you can play the game which we did before, namely we have to assume it's, they are co, it's code invariant. Um, there is a model. Now before we could restrict to countable models when we just define omega consistency and then you know the existence of a countable model which is closed under f and, and the rest is first order this is absolute between v and generic extensions of v in the presence of large cardinals now we we have to talk about um, models which potentially are are bigger than countable because we want to allow that certain parameters uh, are elements of the model, and these parameters might be uncountable in V. Uh, so what I want to say is that there is a model M in some uh, in some generic extension of V, such that okay. For one thing, M is F closed in the sense as we discussed it before, the power set of omega one of V is contained in M, but M does not change the meaning of being stationary. So the non-stationary ideal, that's the notation, the non-stationary ideal on omega one from the point of view of M intersected V is simply the non-stationary ideal of V. You could write this line by just saying that everything which is stationary in V is still stationary in M. Okay, and um, what else? Um, so M is a is a statement. Um, 
M is a model of, of ZFC plus phi. Okay, uh, why do I want bigger models? I mean, the, the point is that I want to allow parameters. Okay, so A, A here might be an element of H omega 2, or it could be a subset of omega 1. So such a statement is omega consistent. And now you know why I want to allow bigger models potentially, namely A needs to be an element. Well, A is a subset of omega 1. So by this line, A is also an element of M. So it makes sense to talk about phi of A as to hold in, in M, right? And, um, okay, uh, this phi comes from the language of set theory, but you can also allow a predicate. In this context, it's very natural to en enlarge the language of set theory by equipping it with a predicate for the non-stationary ideal. So phi comes from the language of set theory, that's the language of set theory, but I also allow a predicate for the non-stationary ideal on omega one. Okay. So now let me um, let me state um, the, the the theorems which um, I want to present here. So this is a. Let me just um, summarize where we are at this point. So the original question was which state, uh, you know, is, is forcing a universal method. And then we discussed, well, it's not really true, but maybe for, if we assume, maybe if we strengthen the concept of consistency, and we now did this by formulating omega consistency and honest consistency, maybe if we strengthen the notion of consistency and also restrict the class of statements where, where the fee is allowed to come from, maybe then we can prove that if something is consistent. We... And now here is the version of that. Okay. <clears throat> so there is a theorem. Which I proved with David Astro. So Again, uh, we have to assume that large cardinals exist. Um, this is the hypothesis. Uh, if you're curious, certainly a proper class of Woodin cardinals would be more than enough. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, the fact that the universe is closed under the M1 sharp operator would be also enough. But let's say, e.g., there is a proper class of Woodin cardinals. So let phi be well, and also we said we have to restrict the class of statements, right? I mean, for instance, the continuum hypothesis. Uh, well, in any well, of course, the continuum hypothesis may be may be forced, but um, we don't have a proof of that if the um, if the statement phi is more complicated than sigma one in in generality. But for sigma one, we have it. So let phi be sigma one in the language we just discussed. This is the language of set theory equipped with a predicate for the non-stationary ideal and let A be your favorite subset of omega one, then we can show that if phi of A is honestly consistent, then not only can it be forced, but it can actually be forced. You know, remember that honestly consistent says that the outer model M, where you realize the statement phi, does not kill any ground model stationary sets. So the forcing extension will have exactly the same feature. So you will be able to force it by a forcing which does not kill stationary sets. Then there is a stationary set preserving forcing.
such that P forces the statement. Okay. Okay. So let me uh, summarize, or let me. Um, uh, there is another way you can phrase, uh, or there is a corollary to this statement, and this is now linked to bounded forcing axioms and to forcing axioms. Um, so let me let me formulate uh, two statements. So bounded Martin's maximum double plus, this is the standard abbreviation for this forcing axiom, is the following statement. So that if phi is sigma one, so it's the same as, as in, the, in the statement of the theorem before, if phi is sigma one in that language, and A is a subset of omega one, if uh, P preserves stationary subsets, stationary subsets of, of omega one, I think I just said stationary set preserving. Okay, let's let's stick to that. Which means that you preserve stationary subsets of omega one. If P is stationary set preserving and P forces phi of A, then phi of A is true in V. There is a, a variant of that uh, where you bring in the concept of honest consistently, consistency and in, in it is um, allegedly stronger, right? So BMM star plus plus is the same thing where the hypothesis is weakened by saying you don't need a stationary set preserving forcing which uh, uh, which forces phi of a you only need that phi of a is consistent so with uh, p forces phi of a being replaced by the hypothesis that uh, phi of A is honestly consistent. Okay, it had been known for a very long time. Uh, there is a paper by David Aspo and myself on that. Uh, Oh, I see. Uh, sorry, I have to, <laughs> I have to um, formulate even stronger statements than this thing. Uh, there are variants of that, which maybe I don't have to actually write down. So let me. Um, so you can also uh, you can also add another parameter in your statement phi, you know, here the parameter is just A, which is a subset of omega one. You can also have a set of reals as a parameter, but then you need that this set of reals gets a new interpretation in the uh, set generic extension or... So, so you need the reals to be universally bare. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. As we discussed it for the functions capital F before, um, if you have a universally bare set of reals, then it has new versions in any set generic extension. So what you can do is in the formulation of BMM double plus or BMM star double plus, you can also allow another parameter, which is a universally bare set. Uh, and you can you can say, well, I only consider um, universally bare sets, let's say from L of R or from some other uh, determinacy model, and this gives a kind of parameterized version of, of these axioms, okay? So, for instance... So, so, maybe you should, I think for some it could be helpful to, to outline that the weakening you are making between BMM++ and BMM star++ is that now, in honestly consistent, you allow any type of forcing. So, maybe omega-1 is collapsed, 
but we are taking small structure which is which is uh, not seeing that omega one is collapsed and you are making p of a true in that structure. yes in the formulation of uh, honest consistency it is true that formally we talk about a uh, generic extensions but I, I never exactly know how to say it. it. It's just in order to make the statement precise, right? I mean, what 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 I really mean by that is that somewhere there is such a model. <laughs> you know, suppose you know, suppose V is an inner model of some outer model. Uh, I would be, if if in the outer model you find a model M like that, then by absoluteness in the presence of large cardinals in a forcing extension of V you would find such a model. So it's not really something about forcing. Forcing in some sense doesn't play any role here, right? Uh, the only thing, I, I don't know how to really formulate it. I mean, what, 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 how do I quantify over outer models of V? We know how to quantify over set theoretic, uh, over generic extensions of V, but I don't know how to quantify over outer models. Um, so this is why I formulated it that way. But by this observation of absoluteness, what I, what it really means is that if you have any outer model of V uh, where we have such a model M, then you're already honestly consistent, right? So it's only talking about forcing on the face of it. Um, so, okay, so I was trying to tell you that you can also parameterize these two things. So you can talk about sets of reals, which are in L of R, for instance. So you have L of R, BMM, double plus, you have L of R, uh, BMM star double plus, right? So we really gave a definition of this axiom here, right? So this means that, uh, th this means, this is the statement BMM star double plus, where you also allow a parameter uh, being your favorite set of reals in L of R. Okay, now it was known, uh, you know, if this is a theorem, I think one direction here was um, is, is in is due to you. What in the other direction here is due to um, David and mine. So again, this is in the presence of large cardinals. So I will talk for another five minutes and then we make a break, right? So um, the following are equivalent. The first item here is star, which I think was mentioned um, by Matteo in, in the introduction. Um, I don't define star, and the reason why I define star is that it's equivalent to L of R BMM star double plus. Okay, let me say that star was formulated completely differently. It was formulated in terms of a forcing which Hugh Woodin um, isolated, which is called the PMAX forcing, and then star says that there is in V a PMAX generic filter over L of R, so that in the extension, uh, you have all of H omega two of V. So this is the formal definition of star uh, plus AD holds an L of R in the presence of large cardinals, we have that anyway. And now we have a, a different formulation. We have a formulation which makes use of the concept of honest consistency. It says that if something is consistent in this very strong form, um, but it's, it's weaker than forcing, and it's sigma one, and you can uh, it's it's consistent, then it's already true. So it's really a, a kind of a forcing axiom. Okay. Um, well, these these two things um, were already known. Uh, let's see. So I should say this is this is Woodin in the other direction. Oops. Uh, The other direction is due to us. And now uh, we can also in, um, expand this list further by the theorem which I mentioned above. 
let me just scroll back and show you what I mean. Uh, here. Right. By, by this theorem, that if something is honestly consistent, then you can actually force it uh, for a sigma one statement. And this is actually also true if you allow a, a set of reals as a parameter, right? So this immediately gives you that these two things are equivalent in the presence of large cardinals, right? Because if you if something is honestly consistent or um, then, then you can force it. And then uh, if you have the forcing axiom, uh, then it's already true. So this is certainly equivalent to this thing. Okay, so one direction here is trivial. This direction is, is absolutely trivial. The other direction is um, the theorem of David and myself from above. Okay, so there is a consequence of this. Of this. So I, I didn't really talk about star, right? And one would have to say a bit more about star than I was able to do in this part of the talk uh, in order so that you kind of can appreciate what's what's going on here. But this is what, what happened. Um, but anyway, I gave you the definitions of, of these two things and that's already interesting. I would say uh, that something which is honestly consistent can be forced. As a corollary of this, you have that um, the unbounded version of the forcing axiom uh, MM double plus, which I'm not going to define now, uh, this implies um, it implies the existence of all the large cardinals you need in order to prove the above theorem, but it also gives L of R the MM double plus, so that this implies the star axiom. Okay. Yeah, Luca. I, I have a very general question. Maybe it's yes, interesting also for the students. Um, why is it so important, this star axiom? So what are the consequences of this star axiom? <laughs> Maybe it's too vague, but just to understand why. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, the, I think the historical quest, uh, the, the historical answer is um, there was the question, you know, um, okay, the, the, there was the question can there be definable counterexamples to the continuum hypothesis? For instance, um, you know, a counterexample to the continuum hypothesis you can also write as there is a function from the reals onto omega 2. If you have that, then you have a definable, uh, I'm sorry, you have a counterexample to the continuum hypothesis. But for any such function, you know, you may simply look at the uh, at, an, at the at the order on the reals on the pre well order on the reals which this function induces, right? So you can look at this kind of thing. And then an effective uh, counter example to the continuum hypothesis, effective or definable uh, counter example to CH is uh, an example is, is such an is given is given by such an f which is well definable for instance pro projective right So it's 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 very very simple. Okay, so there was the there was the question whether there could be an effective counterexample to the continuum hypothesis. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to arrive at such examples in the presence of large cardinals. Without large cardinals, this was easy. But then Steele and von Bezep showed um, that you can force over a over a strong determinism model uh, such a counterexample. And then uh, Hugh Woodin later 
took their proof and turned it uh, into an argument that actually over L of R, assuming determinacy, you can get such a, an effective counterexample. And then further refinements of this technique led to the formulation of the of the star axiom. I think this is what was historically going on. Okay, so um, so this eventually led. I mentioned the Pmax forcing, which is relevant in order to formulate the uh, the star axiom. So this led to Woodin to formulate the Pmax uh, forcing. Uh, by the way, do you also hear this background no noise, or is some? It, it was Matteo microphone. Now I I just close it. <laughs> so you turn it off, okay. <laughs> How many kids do you have, Matteo? <laughs> anyway, um, so it's your okay. kids, Lucas. It's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no no problems. Everything is fine. Um, right. So this is the historical answer. The kind of more systematic answer would be that the star axiom is uh, is interesting because um, the theory Z of Z plus star has some kind of um, formulate some kind of maximality principle of the universe. Well, you know, it is somewhat along these lines here, right? I mean, this is. Um, but this is not how, how you usually formulate the, the maximality principle. I mean, this theorem, which I wrote down here, it tells you, it, it, it gives you some kind of maximality. It gives you some kind of saturation of V, right? Um, or it gives you that if you assume star, then V is kind of saturated. V is saturated with respect to uh, sigma one truth about possible sigma one truths about parameters from h omega two and sets of reals. If something, a state, a sigma one statement is honestly consistent, then it's already true. This is some kind of saturation of the of the universe, right? Um, the usually um, you, you formulate it as this is how you would have formulated it originally. There is something like called pi one, uh, pi two maximality. So you consider you say um, a theory is pi two maximal if uh, whenever a pi two statement, pi two meaning here pi two over h omega two is consistent in a strong form with Z of Z, everything in the presence of large kernels, then it's already true in V. So this this follows from, from star. This is a, just another way of, of spelling out uh, this this kind of phenomenon, which is also spelled out by this theorem, right? The saturation of V in the presence of star, the saturation of V under certain statements about H omega two, and this is why, kind of philosophically, this is an appealing axiom. The forcing axioms also try to spell out maximality, right? I mean, it's uh, the bounded Martin maximum, which is formulated here spells out the same thing, but in an apparently weaker form, namely you, you talk about forcing here, whereas all these star things, they don't talk about forcing, they just talk about honest consistency. This is why star for a while looked superior to the forcing axioms, because you, know, you don't mention forcing there, you talk about consistency. Um, okay, so I hope this was some kind of answer. And also technically, you know, this one thing was historical, the other thing was now philosophically, and also technically, uh, it's a very uh, nice theory. I mean, working on the star, you know, you have the, you have a big machinery of producing, um, of of showing that things hold in under a star. You you have variants of the Pmax forcing, which force variants of um, of star, which can be used for all kinds of things. The common feature is always that you not force over models of the FC, but you force over determinacy models. Okay. So, yeah, I thought what I might do now is just talk about. Um, I, I don't know. I, I I don't want to talk for too long. Maybe I just. Um, I just um, 
move on to mentioning some questions about more complicated uh, statements and and then we can open the discussion uh, I'm, I'm not gonna start any kind of proof of of this thing now I think this would make much sense um, so let, let's as you know in the beginning of my talk I we said we talk you know we have statements about the natural numbers we have statements about the real numbers so these were the hereditarily finite sets these are the hereditarily countable sets the next thing is the power set of omega 1 which corresponds to the sets which are hereditarily of size less than omega 2 now we discuss uh, absoluteness at least sigma 1 absoluteness with respect to to this structure now what about um, what about statements which are even more complicated You know, I mentioned uh, briefly the omega conjecture. So the omega conjecture says that if a statement is sigma two and is omega consistent, then it can be forced. This is uh, these sigma two statements can be very complicated, right? They are not local in the sense that um, they are restricted to a particular um, rank initial segment of the like h omega two, h omega three, or something. They might be verified just somewhere. Um, there is a little bit one can say here. You, um, there is the following characterization, and this now actually gives you, if you want, a definition of Martin's maximum. But it, it really just gives you a um, equivalence. The following are equivalent. There are various uh, equivalent formulations of Martin's maximum. This this is one of them. Uh, so Martin's maximum double plus, which was mentioned in the statement of my theorem of this this corollary uh, here. Okay, Martin's maximum double plus is equivalent to the following statement um, for all stationary set preserving forcings. And for all models, M, uh, whose signature, uh, I think you call it, is at most of size LF1. So you have LF1 many uh, relations or functions or constants associated, right? So let, let me write it as M comma, let, let's just say there are functions around, it doesn't matter. Uh, so there are omega one many here, let's say, okay, just to be specific. Before all such models or algebras, um, um, for all phi, which are sigma one in the language of set theory augmented by a predicate for the non-stationary ideal, okay, and for all, oh, sorry, this, this was it. <laughs> If, if P forces the sigma one statement about M, so this is external. This is not that it's forced that M satisfies something. This would be absolute anyway. It's an external statement about M, right? It's, it's a statement that M has some property. <clears throat> a trivial example could be, you know, maybe M is just the ordinal omega two and then you say uh, the old ordinal omega two has size LF one, something like that, right? Uh, this this can be forced by a stationary set preserving forcing. So the conclusion cannot be that then phi of m is true in um, that phi of m is true in V. That's that's just inconsistent. But what you can what what is true under m m double plus, and in fact it's an equivalence, is that then there is some 
then it's kind of reflected to an object of size L of one, which embeds into M. Then there is some model M bar. There is some elementary embedding J from M bar into M. You know, if M is of size at most L of one, then J can be forced to be the identity. So think of M as a model of bigger size, and then this map J would have a, would not be the identity. Uh, so then there is a J, uh, and actually phi of M bar holds true in V. So this looks like a pretty complicated um, statement, but it's actually you can show equivalent to the standard formulation of Martin's maximum double plus. If you remove, um, uh, if phi is just sigma one in the ordinary language of set theory, then you get a, um, then this is equivalent to just uh, MM without the double plus. Okay, so this is an equivalence. So now we can take this as a, as a way of discussing higher versions of my theorem with David, where we say that um, bounded Martin, that the slightly strengthened version of bounded Martin's maximum is equivalent to the star axiom. So there are now unbounded, now the unbounded versions of BMM, now it's obvious what the unbounded version of BMM star double plus should be, right? So you could say by way of definition that MM star double plus is the statement, uh, is this statement <laughs> with, you know, with the hypothesis, this statement with the hypothesis that P forces P of M being replaced by phi of M is honestly consistent. Now the parameter M here is no longer a subset of omega one. So you have to adjust the uh, definition of honestly consistent just a little bit. You know, before we said that the models um, verifying honest consistency, they should contain the power set of omega one. And now you want to have it contain a larger rank initial segment of E, but that's very easy to do. And then you arrive at a reasonable notion of honest consistency, uh, which, you know, and now the, the obvious question here is, um, I mean, this is now kind of natural, right? Because um, if we write it down, so star, was equivalent to L of R BMM. Uh, well, we can ignore the star here because this was in turn equivalent to, to this kind of thing, right? This implies, I'm sorry, the other way around. <laughs> right, this in turn is equivalent to L of R BMM star double plus, which again is implied by MM star double plus, which I think is not that trivial. There is a little wrinkle here. Uh, but anyway, then there is the question. Now it would be natural if you write it down like this, right? Uh, it would be natural to assume that these two things are actually equivalent. So this is open. In fact, it is open. If uh, MM star the double plus is consistent at all, it leads to the question whether this is consistent at all leads to some very nice um, forcing questions. Uh, you know, you, you 
there is this there is this proof that star is equivalent to to this version of BMM. So you would have to kind of um, generalize this argument in an interesting way. It's not known how to do that. Um, and also there is a question: Can you write something here? Right. So Martin's maximum is a global version of the bounded Martin's of its bounded version, right? So maybe there is some kind of um, global version of the star axiom. Um, I don't know how to formulate such a thing. Um, so that's that's another question. What what can you write here? Might be interesting to look at. Um, okay. There are fragments of this. Um, you know, the bounded versions are equivalent. There are fragments here um, where you do know fragments in the sense of, you know, if the, you have this model which is of arbitrary size as a parameter in the formulation of MM star double class, there is this model right here. It can be of arbitrary size, that's important. Um, so for certain situations when the model is not too big, uh, you can actually um, prove the equivalence. You know, in some cases, this equivalence is known to be true even when the parameter m, the model is now the parameter, is outside of h uh, omega 2. And there is one specific example. Uh, this comes up in the following theorem. So this is with, um, so under a, Martin's maximum. I mentioned before this kind of nice question whether the non stationary ideal on omega one, you know, being non stationary is a pi one statement, so can it also be sigma one? So you can prove that it's not sigma one definable in any parameter A. which is a subset of omega one or an element of H omega two. So a form of, of this equivalence here, <clears throat> which goes beyond the simple bounded version, uh, comes into play when you prove this thing. Well, it, apparently it comes into play. Of course, I don't know, maybe you can avoid it, but this is the only way how I see it. So there are instances where you prove that. Um, so this is kind of a question from generalized descriptive set theory. What is the complexity of the non-stationary ideal on omega one as a set from the point of view of descriptive set theory on omega one to omega one to the omega one. Um, so anyway, this is this is an open question, and there are other open questions in this area. But maybe what we could do now is I stop here, and if there is if there are any questions, uh, I would be happy to answer, or we can discuss a little bit. And Matteo can tell us how to do this formulation. Yeah, is that okay? Yes, sure. So, thank you so much for the seminar. And, thank you uh, very if much. <laughs> anyone has a question, then it's very welcome. Uh, meanwhile, I can tell what is uh, so. Maybe another answer on why p max is important. So, an equivalent formulation, which maybe Ralph said, but it's not transparent because he said many things about p max. It's that you can formulate p max as the statement that uh, any pi two sentence which relativizes, which can be forced to be true for h omega two, it's really true in the in the. Um, in the models of H omega two, you get from P max, so from this wooden axiom star. So this this wooden axiom star amounts to say is equivalent to say if you can force a pi two sentence, then this relativized to H L F two, so you can 
try to send the string sum forcing extension in the get of sum forcing extension, then actually this pi to sentence is true in the mod, in the H omega for the mod star. And this is an equivalent characterization of star. So, so, so it's really saying the improvement is that you know that it's true in this specific forcing extension. Yes. So, so you have control on the model. Star is making simultaneously true all the pi to sentence that you are able to force somehow to be true in HL. Okay. So there is a certain pi to sentence for which you are able to find the forcing and find the a genetic extension by this forcing where H omega two models this pi to sentence. Well, in the model of star, this pi two sentence holds for the H omega two of the model of star. So essentially, it's making true simultaneously all the pi sentence which which you can force. But isn't it, isn't it true that not only the ones which you can force, but also the ones which are omega consistent? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Actually, uh, I think uh, um, that that would improve an equivalence of of star with, with forcing, with uh, forcibility. But it's true so, also what you're saying. I mean, your your result is saying if a pi two sentence is omega consistent, uh, is honestly consistent, then you know, it's, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. It's improving from possibility to honest consistency, but actually, I think that your result is even better because you just have to play around a bit with, with, with what you proved, and you just get if a pi two sentence is consistent with the universal theory of B. So if you build any model which has the same universal sentences, so here you have to be very careful about the signature, so to express very carefully what you are saying about the so then it's true in the in the in the star model in the model of mm -hmm. the H omega mm -hmm. model of star. so it's really saying that um, honest mm -hmm. consistency is catching any possible way you get consistent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes i mean another, another way is another thing is that um with respect to forcing ex Every forcing extension of V, which also satisfies star, it has the very same theory of H omega two period, right? I mean, not restricted to any complexity. Uh, uh, yes, yes, that's the case also. That's another yes, thing. You, I mean, have, this, you this, have a theory of H omega two, which is not, which cannot be changed by forcing. I mean, the proof of that is actually a little bit disappointing. I think it's it's simply because P max is a homogeneous forcing. So the theory of H omega two gets coded into the theory of L of R and in the presence of large cardinals, the theory of L of R cannot be changed by forcing. But in any event, uh, that's another feature. Um, it, it kind of seems to indicate that, um, that you know, that star gives something um, canonical, some kind of canonical theory. Uh, all these things, yeah, okay. sure, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. May I ask another uh, vague question on the future? Um, sure. You always restrict to sigma one sentences, right? If I correctly understood, yeah. but yes. you aim at sigma two, which would be the omega conjecture, right? Yeah, at least more, more or less. Yeah, more I mean less. sigma two un unrestricted, right? Not not sigma two also. over. Um, well, on the other hand, there wouldn't be a parameter, so I, I don't know. It's hard to say. Uh, yeah, but so the, the very question is whether you have some hope to go beyond this sigma one. Uh, I mean, formula is something which speaks about. I don't know. Uh, also, pi one sentences, or would this change something? Would it be more difficult or Impossible, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> um, yes. Um, of course, we thought about it. <laughs> um, it's very challenging. Um, you know, you would kind of... It's, it's so much easier to force a sigma one statement to forcing a sigma two statement. <laughs> I mean, you know, you don't have to care. I mean, you only, when you want to force a sigma one statement, you only want to get this one witness, right? I mean, 
and then you have, don't have to care about the rest. I mean, there is this one witness, and um, okay. Uh, and sigma two is more delicate, right? Uh, you have to you have to make sure. You know, you, you want to force the existence some of something so that uh, it satisfies this pi one statement, you know. And then you force an add and maybe accidentally a counterexample comes in, even though in the witness to honest consistency, it wasn't there. How do you rule that out? So you have to kind of show that you, that your model, which you get by forcing kind of captures really the the truth of this model from honest consistency in a much better way. It looks very difficult. I mean, um, it looks very difficult, but not impossible. You know, I would say maybe uh, it opened a door, as some people would say, but it's not that um, it's not that you, you sit down and, and uh, look one more time and then you have it. I mean, it's there is something to do. Uh -huh. For example, do you think that the omega chon conjecture is true or you have no definite opinion in this respect? I mean, if you had to, if I had to decide on the spot, I would say there are chances that you can, you can actually prove it. I don't see, I, I don't see a, a I don't really see a reason why it should not be true. I mean, maybe you can really prove it in this fashion. You know, you something. You know, this statement is omega consistent, and then you again you cook up a forcing which forces it. But as I said, right? I mean, you have to you have to make sure that um, yeah. I mean, this this fact that that. The forcing extension doesn't accidentally introduce counterexamples to this alleged pi one statement, which is supposed to be true about your witness. Uh, so I don't know. It's a bit like um, you know, it, it feels a bit like the step from sigma to one absoluteness to sigma to two absoluteness, right? Sigma one, sigma two, one absoluteness. A condition on CH with the theorem by Hugh Woodin and sigma to two absoluteness conditioned on anything reasonable is still wide open. And it feels kind of the same thing, right? It's just one more quantifier, but it's 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 also the step from sigma one to sigma two. Mm -hmm. 